once one laugh hits and then the next laugh hits and the next laugh, you you and the audience are all together on a ride now. And it's really exciting. Mm. You're all kind of like, it's like everyone's kind of in the roller coaster and we're all journeying together. So if it sucks, uh, people are still kind of supportive in a weird way, but everyone's excited to ride the highs and lows and uh, that part's exciting. But for music, it's different because I guess for comedy, it's instant feedback. If a joke doesn't work, there's dead silence. So I know mm, mm. it didn't work. Or I can tell, mm. sometimes you can tell as a comedian before you've even said what you're going to say that it's not going to work, yeah, but you've yeah. already teed it up. <laughs> so you just have to keep going. <laughs> but for music, how do you, how do you find that um, experience of connecting with the audience and what what how do you know when it's happening, I guess, also as a musician? bloody tastic <laughs> in that case let's just get started and then we can we can we can have our catch up you know on on record i reckon um because i'm keen to just like Beautiful. find out what the last few years of your life has been like and all that but um oh my gosh me too <laughs> sick <laughs> well maybe I'll, I'll say it i'll say the the fucking it's like the opposite to the safe word um <laughs> and it's several words welcome Jez FM to the Baroque Podcast. <laughs> Yay! Thanks for having me. You're most welcome. I'm fucking thrilled about it. Mm-hmm. We um, I we have you actually came up for me very recently in a conversation I was having, uh, which would be a flashback. I feel like this could be an interesting place to start <laughs> uh, because this may be one of the last times I saw you was uh, I was walking up a hill in Northcote in Melbourne and there was a church on that hill that you and I actually filmed a video in uh, a while ago. Uh, a while, almost, yeah. It's got to be getting on almost eight years now. Yeah. It's been a while. Uh, but I, every time I walk past it, whoever I'm with, I always say, oh, I've been in there. I recorded an amazing song in there uh, with Toby. So wow. I, I, you actually came up probably about a week ago. So that was really exciting. That's so lovely. Would I know your interlocutor? Do you, want, do you want to give him a uh, shout well, out or keep them private? Yeah, <laughs> Never it, was my, it was my partner. That's exactly Ooh. right. Yeah, yeah. It's actually sorry. It's um, they're under they're under strict CIA <laughs> rules that I can't reveal their identity. But yeah, right. Um, so ignore that bit where I said it was my partner. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have a partner. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, well, that, yeah, that's that's um. That's one of the reasons I, I uh, like th- that, that time often pops into my head where you, I don't think like we, we weren't really in contact and then you just reached out like, cause we'd gone, gone to school together and we seemed to get along, mm-hmm. but you reached out. Yeah. It must've been 2014 or 15. Um, you reached out and, um, and said, Hey, I've got a camera. Do you want to shoot? Uh, like I'll shoot you singing your songs in some cool spots. And we went and did that. And, and I just, I feel blessed to have known, known, known you and to ha- have someone like, it's a rare person who does that, who makes like, tries to like reaches out into the world and tries to, to, I don't know, like help somebody and, and make something, make something beautiful. And so I really appreciate that. I, 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 yeah. I think about that regularly. Um, so yeah. Thanks, that man. was, a, yeah, no, that was a great time for me as well, because that was really at a time like uh, we'll get into it a bit later, but I went on to do animation as a bit of a career for a while there. And that actually yeah. where we started there was kind of an intro to that, which was filming. And then I was adding some text effects on there and I actually loved the text effects. So it ended up being a bit of a career kind of thing for me for a little bit there. But I also really liked your music and I liked your, um, when, I, when I heard it, I was like, oh, wow, I never knew this about Toby that much in high school but when i heard your recordings i loved it and actually you also have claim to my favorite cd from about 2014 to 2016 i loved that cd uh the little wow. original mix i loved it oh, so thanks. yeah thanks so much <laughs> and it was indeed a cd back when that was uh-huh. it was physical cd thing. yeah <laughs> oh that's lovely 
Thanks. And yeah, it, it turned out it turned out mm. like not great in terms of <laughs> what we actually did that day. <laughs> Most of the footage was just unusable, <laughs> which was kind of a bummer. But my regret now. Like, <laughs> yeah, it was like a big face part moment because we didn't look at any of the footage while we were there because it was the first time either of us had done anything like this. And so you like you were doing all these sweet like walking around, getting these sick shots, but it just turned out that the fact that you were walking made them uh, very jittery. Um, but but like yeah, I kind of I regret that like mm-hmm. if we were to do it again, I would have just I, I, like asked to if we could organize another date and kind of redone it because i think at the time i I thought i was top shit or something or maybe maybe we were just both Mm. busy but kind of moved on from that and didn't try and make anything more of it but it's a a wasted opportunity i think Uh, look it's 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 beautiful exactly and it's beautiful art that remains in our memories as well and people in their own minds can cast their eyes to what could this have been you know and what (laughs) in their minds how shaky was the footage you know (laughs) so it's exciting (laughs) It's a beautiful thing. Well, I might give you the briefest intro and then get you to introduce yourself. I'm kind of starting this tradition on this podcast where I don't really uh, do much research. It's a pretty cool, um, cool, uh, uh, I don't know what I'm saying. Cool, cool <laughs> attitude to bring <laughs> to bring to a creative product. It's just minimal possible effort. No, that's not. <laughs> I did put in a lot of effort, but yeah. Yeah, I haven't done I haven't done my due diligence. So I know you. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I know you as the guy uh, who who was. Uh, I met you probably. I would have been about age sixteen, and and you would too. I imagine because I moved to. Uh, it was called Boys Grammar then, back in in Canberra in in I don't know what year twenty ten is when I moved there, and so um, you were always. Uh, uh, cracking jokes even then. Um, you were a, a funny guy to be around. I'm, uh, uh, yeah, I'm not very much like that. I'm a fairly serious person as, as things, as people go, I think. And so it's going to be interesting watching or well, like doing this even for an hour. Cause sometimes I think you'll probably try and be funny and I won't get it. And I'll just be like really solemn and, <laughs> and ruin it for you. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, but anyway, I, I knew you as that guy, and then and then um, um, and we kind of re re uh, well, yeah we we split off once year twelve finished, and then rekindled that relationship very briefly for like I think maybe we hung out one other time in Melbourne um, than the time that we filmed stuff. We didn't see each other often anyway. Um, back in 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 the twenty fourteen ish, and then. And then I haven't seen you since, but I've loved some of your skits on Insta. Uh, that's how I know you're still doing funny things and being creative. Um, particularly my favorite one, which I just rewatched uh, yesterday or the day before. There's a, there's a skit about a plant get, getting into um, a relationship with your partner or, well, but everyone is you except I guess the plant and the, and it's all about about it getting its hands on linen threads. I just, I, I fucking loved that. I've, I, yeah, I found that incredibly beautiful. So um, that's all I've got on Jazz FM. Oh, and I know, well, I've seen videos of you doing stand up. I haven't actually heard you doing it. So maybe you were actually just giving like a, like reenacting the most famous Churchill speech or something. But um, I, I suspect you're some sort of a comedian. <laughs> that's where I'm going to leave it. Jazz FM, please introduce yourself. Well, I mean, that's pretty good. Um, uh, and just some <laughs> quick, quick corrections. Not, yeah, uh, please. <laughs> <laughs> some quick corrections. I did actually play the plant in the video. Uh, so that's, you know, oh, another sorry. acting credit to My me. My mistake. Um, <laughs> yeah. No, I'm kidding. Um, makeup and, uh, is really good. Where else going to go? Uh, <laughs> thanks. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, uh, it's actually a really important part of my life is uh, be- being dressed up as a convincing plant. Um, but I also, so I have been doing stand up, but I have also just been standing in photos um, that, you know, as an orator. Uh, so, you know, you can just, if you feel like if at any point you see me with the microphone, please take a picture because it looks fantastic uh, for my stand up comedy brand online. 
Um, so <laughs> what's actually been happening since I last saw you, I guess, to some degree. So I think you gave a great lead up to, uh, to 2014. That's a mm, great mm. spot. So I was dipping my toes into open mic stand-up. Uh, that, that's still something that, you know, I'm still, you know, messing around with doing stand-up. Um, I'm getting more shows uh, more of the time. Um, but uh, I also am doing comedy writing now. So there's a host mm. uh, in, in Australia called Osha who hosts like The Bachelor. Um, and I'm I wondered if that was that TV Osha. I developed. saw that in your- So I'm helping write your... some news jokes. Wow. Yeah. Congratulations. Um, which was kind of a, thanks. Yeah, that was kind of a lucky situation, but um, it's kind of going pretty well so far. And uh, yeah, yeah. And just, you know, stand up is just chugging along. I also do some other things. I do help out with some podcast production. That's why my audio is so crisp, everybody. Um, so crisp. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, uh, by and large, it's just shooting skits. It's um, when I get it, when I get a chance, it's getting to do stand up and writing comedy at the moment. It's all starting to click together a little bit more at the moment, but yeah, I'm very excited to be on because also I've got questions for you, Toby. What is <laughs> Split off point. We split off 2014. We've heard my journey. I'm sure people listening to this podcast understand your journey well, but would you mind giving me a quick, uh, just for our, our personal friendship catch up? You're obviously in Paris now, but Gladly. how did we get there? Sure. I could give it, I'll give a little one because, yeah, people are going to be much more familiar with my story than, than yours. Um, oh, is there something? Oh, before we get onto that, before I forget, let's do a, j- just um, please mention where people can find you online, just so we can say that multiple times and so I can clip it and just distort the crap out of it and, uh, I, I don't know, use it as my message uh, machine, maybe? I, I don't know. But <laughs> where can people That's find beautiful. you? Yes. And maybe mention the podcast as well. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So um, you can find me uh, at Jez FM uh, on everything. So it's you, it's usually J-E-Z-F dot M. Uh, so five letters there. If you're messing that up, something's gone wrong. Uh, but yeah, so that's basically the best places to find me, I'd say. Uh, follow me there. You'll find strange videos. I promise they'll be strange. Uh, and that's that's the best thing I can promise. So yeah. <laughs> Sick. Um. <laughs> Oh, and then, yeah, all right. Then I'll do uh, uh, any podcast you want to shout out to. That was the other part of that. Uh, Are they a bit more uh, defunct? uh, uh, No, I'm I'm working on... Fuck them. Yeah, I'm I'm sort of working on one at the moment, but uh, that's that's TBD. Uh, but if I do want to put out a podcast recommendation, I'm going to say the Baroque podcast. Uh, you can tune in anywhere you're listening to this one because you're currently listening to it. Thanks. I hadn't heard of that one. I'm keen to listen to it. While I'm listening to it. <laughs> All right, I'll give you a quick rundown of my life. Got a great, great guest on this week. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so uh, since 2014, I so I was in Melbourne to study, and so I did a, a bachelor of music there, and, and finished that in 2015, and kind of wandered around for another year, 2016. I, I was just starting. That's when, when Baroque started. That's when Baroque was born and, and Toby Graham died because that's Toby Graham is my birth name and Baroque is my kind of maiden name, my mum's last name. And, um, uh, yeah, started messing around with, with like, bigger production type stuff, started playing with, with a drummer and, and some other musicians, but also just couldn't figure out how to, like, make a living. Um I, I taught toddlers and uh, how to how to sing nursery rhymes and that kind of thing. It was exhausting, and I, I just couldn't couldn't find a way to maintain life. So I moved back to Canberra, um, which is where my where we met and where my my family lives, and lived two years there, kind of rebuilding myself a bit because I was pretty uh, pretty bummed out because I, I really thought when I moved to Melbourne, I thought I would become a rock star and win. And like bef- before I'd even finished my degree, just be like a, a millionaire with a private jet. I'm not sure quite what my plan was, but <laughs> I thought it was going to go better than it did. Um, and and it didn't happen. So I was sort of re- re-understanding myself and the world. And then after two years, um, 2016 is also when I met my wife. Um, we, I like to show off my ring. I think it's really cool. Um, and my wife, Alice Chance, who was the most recent podcast guest if this goes out this this week um i'm turning this into a long-winded thing 
I met her, um, moved to Sydney because we had been together for two years, kind of long distance. She'd come to Melbourne for a bit. And anyway, I followed her to Sydney and, and really found a place there. Sydney's actually really cool for music. I hadn't really understood that until then. And it was very exciting. Got, got a real sense of community for the first, not the first time, but like maybe the best sense of community I've, I've had in my life. I was really surrounded by a lot of good folks. Um, but it is in Alice's nature to, to, um, push me into new and difficult situations. So she um, decided to move to Paris and I thought uh, eventually after much discussion, I would come with her. And so now we've moved to Paris, um, which happened in 2021 and found a, I found a band in each, each city. So I've got like little duo, like drum and bass friends in, in each city I've lived in, which is quite cool. But anyway, I'm in Paris I've got I've got my new <laughs> my new band. I'm working on new records, and finally got myself set up with like speakers and stuff because I'm not not very good at making money. But I figured out how to teach, and I make money via via teaching, and I've been doing that for four or five years now, um, which just makes life a bit better because it's something I really enjoy, even if it doesn't make heaps of cash. But yeah, here I am teaching and making music as Baroque in Paris. I don't know how concise that was, um, but there we go. Now we're done. That was amazing. That was amazing. <laughs> I've learned so much. I feel like that was a beautiful way to summarize what seems like it would have been a huge journey. Uh, so thanks for that. I appreciate it. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Jez. So maybe you can do a, a similar thing and feel free to be, uh, be less concise, um, but I'd love to know what you've been up to um, <laughs> 20, 2014. Yeah, sure. So 2014, um, that was around a time where, um, so I think a, a theme throughout what's going to, what's going to be sort of told through the story is that I have a big theme of self-sabotage and trying to, I guess I tried to live a couple of different lives. What's that And life? I feel like I'm, it, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty tricky. I'm going to be honest. <laughs> It's not easy. Um, <laughs> um, no, but well, Go basically, on. yeah, yeah. From 2014, I always was doing stand up, probably, but it was only happening maybe twice a month. Which, for people that know much about stand up, a lot of people that do it professionally are ideally doing it three to four nights a week. Uh, so twice a month wasn't that much, but it was still scratching the itch a little bit while I was trying to work out what I wanted to do. I studied a degree in journalism. I didn't necessarily want to study it but my parents were like you should you have to have a degree so i was like okay whatever i'll just do this one uh, i was in melbourne which i wanted to go to for stand-up comedy reasons i then nice. um yeah i then worked uh in menswear um and i and i found out sort of uh i worked in menswear and it was really weird because i was the only person at this store that wasn't sort of affiliated to gang people, which was kind of interesting. So wow. I was coming in. It was really strange. I was coming in in suspenders and a bow tie and literally everyone else was talking about how everyone's too trigger happy these days and I really couldn't relate to them at all. But it was an interesting and informative <laughs> experience. Um, so anyway, I learned, you know, vital life lessons like how, how people order hits on people and stuff. I couldn't believe it. I, and I was just, That's you know. A, yeah, I didn't, wow. <laughs> so a lot going on there. And then um, I moved and, and started working at the Melbourne Star, which is like the London Eye. And as I was working there and as I was starting to hate that job and I wished I had something else, I got an office job and I worked in marketing for a year. Wow. And it was really strange because um, it went, I, I was working as an account manager, which I didn't even know what that was, but I was picking up the phone and I gave me an opportunity to look at sort of corporate life, which I guess I'd kind of always been interested in. I never really wanted to do it, but I'd been interested in what it was like to work mm. in a corporate environment. And it was definitely not for me. Uh, it was extremely stressful. And, uh, you know, I was a person getting screamed at by both our bosses and the people calling in because I was kind of the connecting tissue. And I was 22 and it was just a really intense time. But throughout this entire time, like I said, I'm doing stand up probably twice a month. That's kind of rolling through. And then uh, sort of, I guess, Shut down one day, just on a random day. They said, hey, just so you're aware, today's the last day. And I was like, oh, no. And I got really stressed out. And I was looking for other corporate jobs, even though I really hated that job. But I was looking for other corporate jobs. And then my partner just sat me down. She's like, you know what? You hate this. Don't look for these jobs. It's okay. <laughs> just find other stuff and we'll make it work. And I was like, that's actually extremely 
helpful advice right now. So lovely, yeah. Because um, I was having a bit of a crisis. And mm-hmm. so I, I think that was kind of my last, yeah, that was kind of my last step into office work. And then, uh, I, and then I was just kind of doing like, you know, regular retail stuff and uh, 2020 hits and I start producing podcasts for some businesses. Luckily, I have some networks from those branding days and what have you. So I'm producing mm. some podcasts for people. Imagine, yeah, those are super useful skills. skills. Like if you had and to go corporate, like I kind of want for it to get into yeah. marketing and, and, and communications. If Yeah. Yeah. If you want to be a comedian mm. or, or otherwise expressive person. <laughs> Totally, totally, and um, and sorry if this is long winded for everyone, but no, no, this is great. Anyway, so it gets to uh, okay, cool. So it gets to twenty twenty three, and I'm like, you know what? As much as I do enjoy sitting at home doing these, and I can support my own lifestyle just doing podcasts, I actually kind of want to go back to shift work because I want to make more friends and I want to meet more people that aren't really similar to me. I always enjoyed the social aspect of uh, working. So I do also work two days at an organic grocery store now in Preston Market, which is, you know, uh, just fun. And I feel like I have made really good friends through that. So that that was really cool. Um, But uh, yeah. And then since then, I've also been standing, doing stand up a lot more and it's giving me more opportunities. And luckily one of them was, uh, I saw Osha put up a post saying, Hey, uh, he was doing something about news, news comedy. And I'd written for a channel 31 show, which I also just found online randomly. They were looking for writers and I was like, I can do this. Osha was asking, he was just putting it out a new show. I said, Hey, I'm happy to throw my hat in the ring. And, uh, and now that show is getting put to networks. And so hopefully it becomes a TV show where I'm writing some news based comedy, which really isn't my style, but I still like doing it anyway. It's awesome. Uh, and yeah. And then, and then at the same time, I'm just filming more skits. I've always liked filming skits. Uh, so yeah, it's just kind of starting to click together a little bit and, you know, stand up last week. I did one for, I did some stand up for um, something called Extinction Rebellion, which I don't know if it's it over there in Paris, but it's a sort of climate change activist mm-hmm. group. Um, so yeah. Wow. Great summary. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I feel like I, I, yeah, I feel your, um, I feel the self sabotage thing, and the sort of, the um, confusing nature of of finding, well, yeah, just like finding money. <laughs> if you if you're trying to if you're like driven to do creative shit, then like what you want to do is is the creative shit, and the creative shit is is especially once you're starting out, uh, just usually not financially useful <laughs> it's like separate um but it sounds like yeah like it's coming together a little bit which is, is really really cool yeah what yeah what i actually i wanted to i wanted to ask you something about this uh toby because i uh did what with music has there been did you find yourself setting off on a different track i mean obviously you would have started going on a different track than where you're going now mm-hmm. but is throughout your process of this uh of I guess becoming a musician, what would you say there were some mistakes you made early, or do you think you set off on, on a weird course early, or is there anything that you kind of look back and go, that was kind of I don't know why I did that. Like for example, for me, I started when I first started, I made jokes for other comedians, and they didn't even find them funny, and I didn't find them funny, and I regret wow. spending that time not trying to develop my own thing. What I'll answer your question. But can I can I jump in with a question first? Because uh, this is, I feel like to summarize it, it's mm-hmm. like what could you have done better early on, something like that. Um, but but uh, what what were you trying to do if you weren't if you were writing jokes that that you didn't find funny, especially, but also that other people didn't find funny? What what were you trying to do? Like what, were you trying to make them funny and just not you didn't have the skills yet, you didn't understand how to make them funny, or yeah, what what was what was the goal and what was going on there? So I think, um, I don't know if they have this, uh, I, I suppose they do actually, but it's there's a thing called comedy for comedians, mm. um, which I imagine they may, there's probably music for musicians, you know, that oh, if you uh, don't yeah. have, if you don't know, you know, it's, it's like that. So I guess I was trying to be a bit more in that category and comedy for mm. comedians, for people that don't know, is often playing with... Um, it's it's playing with the structure of jokes. So a lot of jokes sound like but up but up but up ba, and you you might go but up but up but up but up but up but up but up. It's, it's almost you know it's it, you change sort sort of the formula of it. You might try and do interesting things where you maybe switch to a character for two words and then you kind of switch out. Um, but it was all essentially just trying to like I guess be unique but 
uh, but at the end of the day, it really didn't end up serving me because I found it. Uh, I, I found that I the reason I was trying to make comedy was just try and make the other comedians laugh, which aren't really the audience for comedy. Comedians mm-hmm. don't actually really go and watch comedy if they're no. not really performing. Yeah. So it's, it was a huge mistake. So, yeah, so that's kind of what I mean. And I, I probably did that for about two years. And then one day I was about to quit comedy and I was like, I hate doing this. I'm not doing very well. And I'm like, you know, I'm just going to do something that I find funny. And then that was actually what worked and I it reignited it. But anyway, so that, that's my experience with that. That's huge. And, and I feel like a lot of comedians I've listened to have recounted some moment a little bit like that of just being like, of having an epiphany of, of, yeah, just not having much success until they, yeah, they decided not to give a fuck anymore or, or something along those lines. Um, and, and yeah, I think it is, it's quite similar. I think we've, you, you we've had some similar trajectories. Um, I definitely, I don't think I, well, actually, so I'm really interested in, in what, in like motivation, I guess, cause I'm, um, I have ADHD and I'm, I'm just, I'm like a, a mess of like enthusiasm, but also un, unachieved goals because I get really excited and then, yeah, I don't iterate. Um, and, and so that, that interests me trying to get better at that. Um, and, and, and when you, when, when you have a goal, usually if, if it's remotely social and most things are, your, your goal is like, is to, to kind of like, to, um, to do good in a community. I think you want to, you want to like, go higher in the hierarchy or you want to like, like enrich, you want people to go like, nice, thank you. And if the people, you know, are comedians, then you're going to try and make those people go nice. Thank, thank you. <laughs> you're gonna, trying to produce something valuable for them. So it kind of makes sense that that's who you would be trying to, um, to make funny for. Um, and I think my music, I'm still very much in that, in that boat. Uh, and, and maybe it's a problem. It's hard for me to tell, um, what am I trying to say? I think I've always managed to make stuff I loved. That's the first thing. So I shouldn't say always, but since I was a teenager, cause I got into this quite early, I started writing and performing songs when I was 13, um, with a band. And so I, I kind of got, I, I learned what I liked quite early before I got too like intellectual and, and, um, yeah. And, 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 uh, musicians music about it. Um, but that said, I still, most of my motivation when writing a song, firstly, there's like, what is true to me and what is beautiful. And then the next thing is like, is my band going to have fun playing it? Or like, are my musician friends going to, going to have like something good to remark about it? And so I still, I, I am very much concerned with that stuff. I think it's secondary, but, but it's still like, if, if I want to keep working, I think, do you know, Andrew Huberman, he's like a, uh, He's, he's kind of a, he's a, a Stanford uh, science professor. I can't even remember, like maybe biology, but he knows lots of stuff and he has a podcast and he, he, he motivates himself by he, uh, imagining, imagining the people he's about to do the work for and, and, and like being like, oh yeah, I value them. And so I want to produce this work for them. And that's, that's definitely how I work, whether, whether consciously or not, a lot of, a lot of what I do is, is for other people, either that, or it's just, it's just masturbation it, it's just like it's just for my own pleasure which like masturbation is great like it's uh, in my opinion you know <laughs> I don't know if that's controversial but like um yeah I, I definitely need some time to just make music where i'm making music for me but but then yeah afterwards th- there would be really no reason to um to like publicize it at all if i just if I was just doing it for me, I want to share it with people. And, and although, although I, I hope that that will bring me some kind of like social and maybe even financial reward. Uh, I don't know how I was going to finish that sentence. Um, <laughs> so I'll just finish it <laughs> mid sentence. No, I mean, um, I, I yeah, think, yeah. Um, well, I mean, I personally, like I said, you had my favorite album for two years, the so CD nice that I owned. Really it was great. I loved it because um, I actually had a CD player at that time. So that was really mm. fun. It was the only CD I actually physically had, but it was also <laughs> definitely my favorite CD. Um, <laughs> I did listen to it a fair bit, but I always, I've, I've always found that your music, at least from what I've heard, 
Um, and I can understand that it may be a maybe a little musician for like music for musicians, but it's also everything I think is on a spectrum between factory produced music and music that is so complex that it's almost inaudible. And I think that you fit in a really nice spot along that timeline in the sense that whenever I hear your music, it's always something new. It's always fresh. And so I always, I'm always interested in it. Um, but it doesn't, to me at least, it doesn't reach the point that it's totally inaccessible for me where I, you know, I've heard some live jazz albums that I just couldn't get through because it's, you know, making different sounds mm-hmm. out of the saxophone or what have you. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know. I, I, and I also think one point that you brought up that was really interesting was the fun playing it live because for me, I have that same sensation with stand up, which is that every time I'm doing stand up, I always try and at least have one bit that's new because it keeps me really engaged. And that's the fun bit that I can play mm. with on stage. It can be sandwiched in other bits that work so that everything's already popping along well. And then I'll mess around with this bit. If it doesn't work, it's okay. I've got other stuff later that will save me. But uh, that is where the fun is. That's you, You're so in the zone. And um, yeah, I thought that was a really interesting comment. I'm fascinated because I actually did one of the questions I'd written down for you, um, which was what makes something fun for you? Because I'm so interested in fun. Mm. Totally. Oh man, you've got all these uh, good questions, and I want to. I want to make this podcast more about you. So I'm gonna once again. <laughs> I'll try and be be quick about it. Because uh, um, I want to know. I, I don't think we've covered what you did wrong early, or like what you would do oh. differently, kind of thing. In fact, let's do that, and then I'll tell you what I think is fun. And, and, great, and great. That first. sounds good. Come on. Yeah, I mean, so I mean, I first, I think the first mistake was um, trying to be too funny in a more abstract sense, in a comedy for comedians type way. It's mm-hmm. probably the first mistake I made. And the second thing that I really made was I loved doing new stuff. And I kind of like you, where I had a, well, what you were talking about before, where I had a lot of goals. Um, and I was struggling to hit all of them because each one required energy. And it was it was kind of like that old thing of, you know, chasing two rabbits, you end up with none. Mm. Um, and so I think that what I've been able to do a bit more, and it's also for me, it was also my stand up was totally unrelated to each other. So it might be a bit about the housing market and then it might be a bit about kinder eggs. And while that is good in a one set that you're watching and it doesn't matter, when people see you again, they have no idea what to expect. Whereas mm. people that, in comedy that are good, you when you click on them, you have an idea of what their perspective is and you know more or less kind like you don't know the topics they're gonna to talk about, but you have an idea of kind of where what they are amorphously as a brand to some degree. Mm-hmm. Uh, um and so I didn't really have one of those either. And so and not that that's super important, but it is important if you want people to follow you. And to some degree in Melbourne, getting booked as a comedian is how many people can you bring to a gig or mm. what have you. You know, hey, it has a lot to do with popularity more than necessarily talent um, or skill or anything like that. And that's totally fine. That's just part of the game. So Same part of that is also sure. being able to, yeah, exactly. Part of that's just about being able to make something that when people say it, they go, oh, okay, I know what this is. Mm. Uh, and this person's on again. Oh, great. I'm excited to see what the next chapter essentially is of what I've already seen. Um, so, yeah, I'd say that. That's I'm trying to sort of hone that in, um, which I think I've pretty much got a lot. It's definitely a lot better. And uh, mm. and I'm working on stuff a lot more so that the jokes are, you know, the screws are in nice and tight for a lot of the jokes. Uh, and, and I'm still throwing in stuff that I improvise with, but uh, that's a lot less of the performance than it once was. Mm. That's exciting because, um, yeah, maybe I can just dive in intuitively and we'll get to the question later, or maybe we won't. But um, uh, uh, my understanding of comedy comes almost entirely from like big American comedians, um, and and the, like working in LA and New York is is where I I like know anything about how it works, kind of thing. And there, that they're very big cities, and so the way I understand it is you like you do sets, um, even if you're a big comedian, often you won't list your name. Um, and then you'll you'll go to somewhere where no one knows who you are necessarily, and you'll you'll try out jokes, and and slowly you'll pick out the ones that that work best, and and you'll refine them, and eventually build up a set that you can tour, and then then you'll be telling more or less the same same material. Although some there are some comedians, this guy's pretty edgy. Do you know Andrew Schultz? Yeah, yeah, he does a lot of crowd work, and and that seems to be like obviously he can prepare a bit, but not a lot. Um, anyway, yeah, there's a 
that's how I understand it working. How does it work for you in Melbourne? Because it's like, it's a whole different, it, it might be a whole different world. World I don't, I don't understand. And yeah, I don't know how exactly how it sounds like you're working on, on, on stand up type stuff. So yeah. Yeah. Well, actually um, I'm going to give, I'm going to give everyone a great uh, stand up comedy insight secret uh, today. Mm. So this is a really good one. It's about crowd work. Um, and that is, uh, this isn't always true, but it is true if you want to seem like you're quite good at crowd work r- really quickly, but you can make yourself look really good, which is that, say I have a joke that's about dogs, okay? Uh, what I can do is I can ask the audience, is, is uh, like I can pick someone in the audience and I can go, are you a dog or a cat person, right? And they, well, however they respond, I have two jokes pre like prepared mm, mm. so it, so it and it, it always works a treat it's a really nice technique but uh it also makes you look good at crowd work now i'm not, mm. oh, I'm not saying this is what andrew schultz does i'm just saying this is a great this is just a bit of comedian sort of you know magic uh that people may be able to employ in their own lives or if you're ever up on stage you can look really quick-witted but really you've spent hours preparing both answers mm. and responses so um yeah i definitely little, noticed that bit. um in my own speech because very occasionally I will think of a joke before someone's finished talking about what they're saying. And so, or or like just something to say. Um, And, and like for me, I I don't, I don't work with this at all, but sometimes intuitively I come out with something and people say, wow, that was really quick. And to me, I've just been kind of like bumbling along at my usual pace in my head, but yeah, exactly. It it was pre-prepared and it surprises everyone. Um, Yeah. That's very cool. Very, very yeah. Cool. Um, but yeah. Anyway, so with with the um with the question you asked before though, uh, yeah, how does so comedy work with in Melbourne? Melbourne? Yeah, it's really it's an interesting system. So it's very much a tiered system. Um, so if we just look at, for people that may know Australian comedians, like let's just say the top tier is someone like a uh, Dave Hughes or what have you. And for people that don't know, just kind of like a is someone that's been on Australian TV and uh, has done a bit of radio work. Uh, so he might be in the top tier and Will Anderson, um, who's in similar category. And these are people that they could tour the country with an, with essentially like a stage show, uh, a one hour show, and they fill up dates left and right. Then there's like a sort of next tier down, which is, um, which is now sort of becoming more popular, which is social media people, people that are big on social media, who again will still sell out pretty big venues. And that's just mostly on the back of them being funny on social media. And then there's people that are just professional comedians. Um, I would point people to someone called Jared Goundry, who's uh, someone I know, who just tours and he tours all the regional cities in Australia. So he might go to, you know, like Aubrey Wodonga and his whole job is just touring regional uh, Australia. Mm. And then there's just like city comics, people who play clubs regularly in uh, in Melbourne. And then there's sort of um, open mic talent and then there's just new entrants. So people that are open mic talent are, Anytime there's an open mic night, you might see the same 30 people on the headliner kind of thing. They'll be like, oh, this person, we've got this person. And then below that is people that are just kind of throwing their hat in the ring. So that's kind of how it works. And you kind of Mm -hmm. essentially just want to keep building up those tiers. You want to just keep trying to jump onto the next one. And obviously, it's not linear. You're not immediately on one tier. Most people are hovering between one or the other. But um, if you can start getting some of the gigs that the next tier would get, that's kind of the the plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see. And would you, I kind of imagine not because there are comedians who, who don't do the, 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 the lowly club uh, thing, but like would Dave Hughes build a set at like a, like, like the crab crab lab or something in, in Melbourne? Like what? Um, yeah. What did you, do you know? Uh, I, I, I mean, maybe not specifically about Dave yeah. Hughes. But, <laughs> so probably not um he might like he might drop in and do five with material that he hasn't done but i mean it's kind of it's it's actually different in australia than other places as well because australia has quite a um forgiving audience australia's are usually a pretty hot audience already in other countries Mm. you have to win people over in australia especially it's pretty renowned internet like for international comedians is already having a hot audience. So everyone's already ready to laugh. Mm. Uh, so a lot of, nice. so you'll see, especially if you're in Australia, you'll see a lot of people that were on TV probably in the 2005 era of, you know, um, Spicks and Specs and, um, uh, you know, Thank God You're Here and what have you. A lot of those comedians are still doing really well 
because the audiences are so ready to see them again. They're people they already know and those audiences come in hot and those comedians, though they can pop around and do gigs, uh, can basically bring out new material and test it on the tour and people are still excited to see those people. Wow, that's fun. I, yeah, I saw that. I, I went and saw another co- controversial name, went and saw Louis C.K. in Paris mm-hmm. and for the last 10 minutes... He was just trying out new shit because he could. Mm. And he, he told everyone, he was like, all right, now I'm going <laughs> to try some new things. And they were like, some of them were pretty, like, they've really flopped. They didn't, they didn't work great. Because, like, you know, half of the Parisians don't necessarily speak great English. So, yeah, it was like a, a pretty strange space to try the stuff out. It was cool, though. I don't know. I thought it was interesting. <laughs> yeah. And that is that what he was doing at the end there is A, about building the set, but it's also B, about that's the fun part for him. You know, he's just like, this is new stuff I probably thought of yesterday or today. Let me just see how it goes mm-hmm. and I'll have fun with it. You know, it can't, as, once he's already teed up that uh, it's new material, everyone's just primed to be like, okay, well, you know, if this sucks, it doesn't matter. It doesn't impact how I think about him. So, mm. and yeah, do, sorry, this is, this feels related emotionally. I don't know how it's related. It, it's a bad comedy. Do you like being on stage? Like you said, that, that's right. We're getting back onto fun. Uh, you said he, that's the most fun part for him. D- yeah. Do you, do you like it? What's your experience on stage? Because mine's mine's kind of rocky. <laughs> it, it depends a lot on the audience, um, and and just on like yeah. I'm not. I'm a fairly neurotic person, and so actually like being sort of very present and and feeling feeling a good connection with the audience for me is is quite a difficult thing to achieve consistently. Um, yeah. What about what about you? Do you like it? I, um, I, I'm very fascinated. I'm going to ask more questions about how you feel on stage because mm. I find that extremely fascinating because I would mm. say I might even be the opposite. Um, I am very happy to kind of go up loosey-goosey uh, where, but, but I, I wonder if we're trying to achieve the same thing, which for me is, again, about presence. For me, if it's a little bit more loosey-goosey, I have to be more locked in on stage because I feel like if I'm a little bit unprepared, I'm going to have to sort of engage more of my senses to stay on top of everything. Uh, but I, I personally have always loved it. Even back in uh, at Boys Grammar, I was doing mm. funny speeches. Uh, that's so it's always mm. kind of been essentially in my DNA uh, to some degree. So when I found out, it, like essentially when I found out what stand up was, I was so excited because I'd already been doing sort of similar things with school mm. speeches. Uh, so it was exciting to find that there was something that you know was less about education and more just kind of whatever you thought, but similar style. Mm. Um, but yeah, no, I love it. I and. I mean, it's exciting. I, I I think for music, it's different. But for comedy, uh, it's uh, it, like once one laugh hits and then the next laugh hits and the next laugh, you you and the audience are all together on a ride now. And it's really exciting. Mm. You're all kind of like, it's like everyone's kind of in the roller coaster and we're all journeying together. So if it sucks, uh, people are still kind of supportive in a weird way, but everyone's excited to ride the highs and lows and uh, that part's exciting. But for music, it's different because I guess for comedy, it's instant feedback. If a joke doesn't work, there's dead silence. So I know Mm, mm. it didn't work or I can tell, Mm. sometimes you can tell as a comedian before you've even said what you're going to say that it's not going to work, but you've already teed it up. (laughs) So you just have to keep going. (laughs) But for music, how do you, how do you find that um, experience of, connecting with the audience and what, what, how do you know when it's happening, I guess, also as a musician? Just to bookmark, I want to know when you discovered what comedy was and, and, and what that was like. <laughs> um, and it sounds like, it sounds like, yeah, I think you might be more biologically made up for, for comedy, at least than I am, which is great um, because I imagine, yeah, sometimes it, you really bomb and you want to be able to take that well. Um, whereas I might, I might really, not be able to leave my house the next day. Um, no, nah, I think I've become more resilient. I think I, I actually, so yeah, partly with music, what am I trying to say? No, I think my my most accurate answer is probably going to be that I have not, um, I've not taken enough care with the quality of my uh, gigs so like I've I've tried to build a really good performance, but then I'll take any old venue that will take me in any area, and then I at least in the past I often wouldn't do a very good job at publicizing it or bringing my friends, and so I think I've got a pretty I've done a lot of shows, um, or like in Melbourne for example I did 
I think I managed a hundred in a year. Like I just fucking, and as, as a, as a, an amateur, essentially, like no one was coming to these shows. You kind of almost shouldn't do that. I think in hindsight. Um, so this is kind of like what you, what I, what I did wrong at the start. So we're, we're bringing all these questions back together. Um, but yeah, I think, I think a big mistake there, I've played to a lot of empty rooms um, and, and to people who don't really want to hear me, even if they're full. And so people are just talking and, and not getting a crap about the music and the music I write is quite uh, melancholic or emotional in a way that, that it really works if everyone's paying attention. And, and a lot of my best shows, everyone's silent because they're just engaged and we're just like having emotional sex. And <laughs> yeah, I, I don't, um, yeah, I, I think that's what I've learned is like, I have a tendency to optimize for um, volume because I thought, how do I get good at shows? Do a lot of shows. Okay. And I did get kind of good at doing a lot of shows, except I, I got used to fairly negative feedback or just no feedback from the audience. And so now I've done a few bit better shows because I, I, I'm more careful about it now. I really hustle to get, get a crowd in and, and to, to publicize the thing and, and to get good bands to play with. Um, those shows have been a lot better um, in terms of an emotional experience, because there are people there and they wanted to hear the music. Um, and so I think, I think that's something to remember because like in abstract, I just, um, I, I had this sort of epiphany, um, yesterday in abstract, if you optimize too much for quantity or like if I try and do too many shows, um, then I lose the, the quality element. I don't manage to make them really good, exciting shows where lots of people come. And then I actually lose out on quantity as well because I'm so like miserable about it. Like if you do a lot of terrible shows in a row, you just feel like you don't want to do it anymore and you lose the, the, the zeal. Um, and so that's something I'm really trying to learn from, from Alice, who's kind of the other way. She, she, if she's got a project in front of her, she wants to make that as good as it possibly can. And often she will like, uh, her problems come from too much, too much of that, I think. Um, but she 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 does she does a banger after banger, and as a result, she gets positive feedback and and does she's she's quite productive, I would say. Sorry, that's that's abstract, uh, not not so many concrete examples, but I think I think I think useful, and maybe maybe that leads us into things you would have done differently earlier. I, I, yeah, that's what I'm going to ask you. There you go. <laughs> well, I mean, I think I also just before we get on that, I actually want to touch on something because I think it is interesting because it's something that I've definitely experienced as well. Mm. And I, you know, when you're talking about you, when you started doing stuff and you didn't even necessarily invite people, you were just kind of like you were saying, going for volume. Mm. What do you think? What do you think was um, going on uh, for you there mentally? Why weren't you inviting people? Because I well, find this yeah. fascinating as well. Okay, so it's something that I see within myself as well. So, mm -mm. well, I'll give you, I'll give you the the truest kind of depressing. Um, it's like the most important epiphany of my life. I now realize that at that time, at least part of me was trying to do some kind of a performance uh, for all the people around me and myself. Like I was tricking myself. I wasn't consciously aware of this. I'm very interested in like unconscious processes and stuff. So. Um, maybe this will sound strange to people who aren't as interested in, in like in that sort of thing in, in like Freud and Jung and, and psychology, old psychology shit. But um, I was trying to perform to the people around me an act of doing of being really honorable and like doing doing my absolute best while all the while failing. I was kind of trying to act out like like a pseudo Christ narrative kind of thing. Like, look, I'm trying my absolute best and just getting fucked by the world. Isn't that sad and beautiful? Um, and yeah, it took, I, I, I was probably like that from, from finishing school at least till, till age 22, I think, where, when I started kind of figuring that out and I was like, hang on, I'm just not trying that hard to do well, or I'm being a, such an idiot about it that I think I've been actually a bit deliberate about how how much I've sabotaged myself here, so yeah, that that is probably I think that's what I was trying to do is like seem like I was doing everything I possibly could for things to go well, but secretly actually wanting it to go poorly so that everyone could go oh poor you. Mm. 
<laughs> there you go. Yeah, I, what about I, you? you know, I find also within, within myself, it's something that um, I definitely appreciate that. And it brings true for me as well. But I think also for me, sometimes it's a bit of a thing of, um, uh, I don't know whether it's sort of almost like a lack of self-confidence where you're like, I don't, I, I don't know, is this, is this that good? Do I want people to see me at this point, you know, or do I want to get better before I bring people in as well? Mm. And, um, and I think also it's just, yeah, I don't know. There's like this, uh, this thing of if I do try my hardest, what if it doesn't go well? Cause that's more painful than not mm. trying mm. and it not going well. And you're like, well, you know, I wasn't, I never really gave it a fair shot. So, you know, you know, I, what a, you know, I, I, I don't know if I'm bad or good really because I totally. never I fully attempted it. I definitely feel that as well. Totally. Mm. 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 I'm um, still, I, I'm I still had another struggling. question for you, too. Oh. Oh, oh, no, no, go, 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 go. <laughs> Quit it with the questions, would you? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to say, oh, yeah, I've, I've been wondering, I've been questioning myself lyrically on this front recently because I've always written lyrics that are, pretty veiled. Like I like exploring sort of religious topics and, and, and stuff that feels like big and not that personal really, or like it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't come off as that personal lyrically a lot of the time. And, and I think my most, I think the songs people have liked most have often been ones where I do just mention something that is kind of clearly a personal expression. Um, so I think, I think I'm doing that. That that kind of that same thing is I'm I'm very worried about truly showing myself, which is which is a strange dichotomy because I think most people who know me know that I'm pretty happy to like talk about the size of my penis or or deep insecurities. Like first meeting, I don't actually I don't mind talking about that in conversation, but somehow singing about it, I get I get weird when you kiss me. Look, I mean that's I mean that's interesting though because I think it's it's uh it's kind of a different headspace because it's artistic um uh, and versus just personal because I also find that that I feel quite similar to you in some regards to that and um you know like I, yeah I don't know there, there's certain things that almost feel too maybe an artist's too close to the nerve for some reason but I can just talk about it as well uh you know totally openly it's a that's a fascinating point i like it cool did you have any <laughs> we kind of covered do we have did you cover what what you would have done differently yeah 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 we i think we got through that it was like um i i would have written jokes more for myself i spent, i think right, the right. most crucial thing at at the end of the day really though it's more crucially it was just about i needed to i mean first of all i think actually the most crucial thing was that i needed to go to therapy and then the second right. most important thing after that was kind of really just trying to work on myself and then from there build it from the base up as opposed to kind of going external in, which was what will comedians find funny and then sort of working backwards from that point. And now it's more, what do I find funny? You know, like I do jokes that I know aren't funny, but it still tickles me. I'm doing a joke that involves Yu-Gi-Oh quite a lot. Uh, I know that most people go, you know, I've heard of Yu-Gi-Oh, maybe I've seen a, a, an episode, maybe I've seen the cards, but I don't know that much about it. But for me, it satisfies my soul to say that joke, you know, because mm, mm. I know if I was in the audience, I'd go, that was, that was good. Heck yeah. And it's weird how funny, funniness is, is, is odd. And actually I'd, I'd be interested in hearing how you define humor because the way I understand most comedians the way they get validation is people laugh right mm. um and, and laughing's weird because sometimes you'll do it like i'll laugh at shit and i i didn't want to <laughs> or i'll laugh at shit <laughs> and not expect to at all like i did a, a like i spat my tea out at, at, a, at a comedian that i was watching on on uh, taylor tomlinson i don't know if you know her. i did a damn spit take and nearly ruined my computer because i just didn't mm -hmm. expect to be li like <laughs> so compelled but i should have because i was watching a comedian um but yeah what what um how do you see humor and then and then i don't know talk talk about how you see humor sure sure i think i think humor is an interesting thing it's uh it's to stand-up comedy is slightly different than other forms of comedy i think and i think with stand-up comedy a really crucial element is confidence uh, and that may seem odd because there's a lot of comedians that have a sort of 
self-deprecating or um, almost anxious performance style. But the way you can read confidence in a comedian is how settled are they as things aren't appearing to work? How much mm. they're staying essentially locked in? That's usually what you can say. And with stand-up comedy, if you go to any open mic night, you, you can usually tell who's going to be good and who's going to be bad just simply based on how confident they are. People can even, like the difference between bombing and stand-up versus just not having a funny set can be I lost confidence halfway through and the audience felt kind of like they started to get nervous for me. Whereas um, I've seen people offer a five minute set, no laughs, but they did totally confidently and you walk away going, Oh yeah, that was all right. You know? Mm -hmm. uh, so, so in stand up comedy, it's definitely very, very linked to confidence. Uh, I think in everyday life, it's a surprise and it's, you know, something that may uh, tickle you in a in a way that you know maybe you connect to a, a disparate things or maybe it's a callback and you're reminding someone of a joke you made before. I think it's a more abstract concept, but um, but but I think it it ideally for me this isn't true of all people. I like it when it has a creative element. Someone I don't know that does voices does a voice. For me, I'm always going to laugh at that, even if it's not mm. funny, because I like the strangeness <laughs> of it. Um, yeah, but I do think it's quite a it's quite a abstract kind of uh, concept, and yeah, I, I think I can only really answer it properly for uh, stand up comedy. Mm. Yeah, right. And yeah, it's interesting. Or like, do uh, oh. yeah, um, yeah, go. <laughs> I, um, <laughs> I guess I, I want to get more out of you about the the kind of pivot from from like jokes for comedians to to jokes for everybody well it may, well i guess it wasn't that because it's also jokes for yourself it's like you you found things that that you were telling jokes you weren't that convinced were funny first and then you started saying like yeah doing jokes that you thought were funny but what am i trying to say mm -hmm. i guess that just that seems very important no for, i understand for my place in the world yeah yeah talk talk more about that that i love transformation i love to yeah to dig, to dig deep into that. So, a hundred percent, exactly what you. So, what you're talking about, and what I was mentioning before, with um, sort of having that set where I was just deciding, you know, what I'm just going to do this one for me, and it doesn't matter if it's funny because my other sets haven't been funny, and so if I get no laughs, so, I'm in the exact same position. But I'm just trying stuff that I think that I personally think is funny. Like this Yu-Gi-Oh joke would fit within that uh, transformation. That, but it really, was there a Yu-Gi-Oh yeah, yeah, joke in your first uh, set? It, and, and wait, was this this one set? Was it like one set to rule them all? This one new it, different it, one? It was. It was. It mm. was. Um, it went from jokes that were sort of had nothing to do with my life, and I can give you one because I just remembered Oops. it. Uh, and, and you can say you can say it wasn't that funny, but you can kind of say I was just kind of messing around. It was um, oh, what was it? It was something along the lines of like, uh, I guess the person that invented the saying "the cat's out of the bag" wasn't an animal rights activist. It's kind of like that where you're like, oh, okay, um, <laughs> you know, uh, you just kind of, uh, I can't remember fully what it was. It was slightly better than that, but not much better. And it was just kind of strange stuff like that where you're just like, uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sounds like the kind of thing you might have said when I first knew you at school. <laughs> it sounds true to your, <laughs> true to your spirit yeah, uh, somehow. Definitely. Uh, but, but then, um, you know, uh, I started doing more material that was kind of a bit about like, uh, you know, at that time I was probably smoking a lot of weed. So I was just like, you know what, I'm going to do some material about that. Uh, you know, even though that's not a crazy uncommon stand up topic for me, it was because I was doing stuff that was very, you know, had nothing to do with my life. Mm. And, um, and then, yeah. So, and then it became more personal stuff. Every time something interesting in my personal life would come up, I wouldn't take that story and go, that's the joke. I would go, what, what can I take? What's the funny bits to pick out of this that I can then actually make something that's a personal thing? And now, yeah, now a lot of my stand ups just being about tw uh, being a 28 year old, soon to be 29. Actually, it's my birthday tomorrow. So that's exciting. Um, wow, but, happy birthday, uh, 29 year old. <laughs> Thanks. Um, being a 29 year old in Melbourne and just living through inflation and lockdown and what it's like to just kind of be this age and um and what have you and i i'm finding that a i'm it's cathartic because it's about being you know inflation's really bad here uh rent market's devastating and it's hard to get into stuff and 
Uh, I'm finding it's cathartic for myself also to talk about things that I'm struggling with, but spin it so that it's also relatable to other people that are around this age group um, in this uh, time that I know are having similar problems. So it's, yeah, I think it's almost become like I was doing stuff that was for comedians and now I'm doing stuff that hopefully people that are punters come in at least can either see my perspective or hopefully if they're around my age, understand and go, yeah, I totally get what you're talking about and this is true. Mm. That's a interesting. Yeah, this is true. Feels like a feels like a p- important element of comedy. Like I feel like I don't tend to laugh at stuff that I don't feel on some deeper level is true. Even even if it's like absurd uh, mm. materially, whatever. Like like if you're making a joke about having a cat in a bag on stage where you clearly don't have one, then clearly mm. that bit isn't true. But there's something about it that will ring ring true. Is probably the way. Yeah, that's special. Mm. Yeah, how do you how do you feel about truth? How about I I ask questions like this and tell me if they make you uncomfortable because they're very <laughs> open ended, but I really like them. I don't know. No, on. I think I think that it's a uh, I I love these questions. It's good. It's you don't I, like I don't know. Sometimes I just end up at parties where it's very small talky. So this is lo- mm. lovely to yeah, talk about. The this. Opposite. Uh, yeah. <laughs> exactly. I've actually for people that want to check it out, I do have a great bit about uh, small talk at parties. So you know um, that video hopefully will be coming up soon. But it's definitely in the set right now. I'll see um, if I can have it recommended next on <laughs> on the YouTube uh, final screen. Um, but uh, but yeah, I think truth. I well, I I think there's an interesting uh, connection that I am still grappling with a little bit. But it's between it's this weird dichotomy of truth and str- and vulnerability and strength. Because for me, typically, I've always been someone who's quite reserved. I have a wall up where, and because I do, because I'm quite funny when I'm talking to people most of the time, there's no reason to get into too much of the deeper stuff, which is, Mm. you know, so, and I guess I, you know, I guess if we're talking about, I'm talking about truth from like a within internal truth and maybe, you know, things you might believe about yourself as opposed to facts um Mm -hmm. but to me that is that feels like the most true stuff is and feeling comfortable to share that um and like it's something that i didn't do for a long time um i felt definitely like i i was happy to have very surface level relationships with people but i have found that being able to just i guess be vulnerable and give people the opportunity to just even listen to kind of true things about me has made me also feel better about myself and that allows me to live a truer version of myself in general mm. because often when it's just like one person, you're going, hey, like for example, this is a great example that's happening in my life right now is that um, for my whole life, I've had fragile skin, okay, which is a weird, like just not not in a metaphorical sense but in a very literal sense. Like my skin is just fragile and like I never thought too much easily. Better. Yeah, yeah. Like I'll show, I'll see if I can, but you can see, people can see there's a little damage here. Yeah, and that is just from me discount. accidentally. Yeah. Um, for people that aren't looking, there's a tiny little cut on my pinky, but that's just for me bumping my hand into something. Like it's just like my skin has a very low threshold for um, injury and I never really thought too much about it. But last year, my partner and I, we took a trip and we were in Greece and she was like, oh, how come you haven't ever looked into this? And I was like, oh, you know, I just, you know, like it's the wall thing. I just keep everything that's annoying me kind of back. And I just present a thing. And she's like, you know, you should probably get this looked into. And I've got it looked into and it's been a long process. But really, like, turns out it's a disability called epidermolysis bullosa. And it's um, and only about 1,200 people in Australia have it. It's really rare. Um, and so I'm going through this process now where they're mapping my genetic coding to see wow. what bits are wrong. It's a, and, uh, and, but what's ended up happening is there's all these benefits for me having gone in and getting it checked up. I just got, all the, I got this huge shipment today of medical supplies. I got Sick. about 10 kilos worth of uh, medical stuff. And, <laughs> um, I, it was, it was really wild. I was like, what is this? Is this my birthday? <laughs> no, it's just, uh, it's just band-aids. Um, but, <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, and and like I get all these benefits, like I can buy shoes for free and what have you. What? Anyway, all this weird stuff. I know it's weird. That's it's, amazing. It's all part of the, I know. So, but like it, I found out, I got a free flu shot for having asthma. But this is <laughs> next level. This is amazing. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but that that Thanks like I feel me. like I'm 
Uh, yeah, exactly. I feel like I'm just like, I, I don't think I'm at any end point. I'm, I'm just talking about to people from, you know, where I'm at in this journey of being able to tell the truth, but I'm finding it's definitely allowing me to be a lot more truthful. And like, for, for example, this is an answer I couldn't have given you six months ago because our mm. wall would have been much higher up. But now I feel more comfortable. That's like, I don't think Toby's going to burn me with this information, you know, or, <laughs> so, so I'll do my um, best yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Thanks. So to, what about you? What does, uh, what does truth mean to you? That's fun. Well, something I want to remark on um, was uh, that, that feeling of, of having shared stuff, uh, true stuff or deep stuff, um, and then finding out that, yeah, that no one has like used it against you. That, that is an amazing feeling that I just, I keep getting high off. I think it's why I, I started doing it conversationally from an early age, just being like, yeah, I, you know, I don't even know. I, I really do wish, uh, like, I felt more acceptance in my musical taste from my dad or something, you know, um, which which kind of lays you open to, to, to some, I, I, people could pay you out, I guess. But, like, h- hearing it go in and people being like, oh, yeah, that sounds reasonable. Or even having them pay you out because, like, yeah, I don't know, just – Expressing that stuff kind of makes you feel very, very strong and, and, and secure in a strange way. I've noticed it with these podcasts as well. I'll like, I'll say all sorts of stuff and then put it on the internet and be like, oh, look, you know, no one's like, <laughs> no, it's not like my friend group is going to disown me or something. I, yeah, I can just like, I can say things. <laughs> we can, we can speak. Yeah. It's so empowering. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, a hundred percent. Yeah. But I think truth, truth, truth to me is like intuitively a giant value. I notice like if, if someone tells me uh, even like a sort of half lie, like a white lie or something, and I sort of sense it, I, I feel like that some facts don't quite add up because they were like not super precise. And it, like maybe it's an accident, right? Like someone just tells me like... I don't know. I only drink skim milk, but I've seen them have a drink of full cream. It'll <laughs> bug me. Like, I won't even know what's bugging me for a while. And then I'll be like, hang on, that doesn't add up. I'm really bothered. So, yeah, I think I have like a, I, I value it deeply, at least in my relationships. I, uh, like, it's, it's one of the biggest things with Alice and me. We're, we're just very honest. You know, if we have a crush on someone, then we'll tell each other about it. Like, and that's, I think that's a very useful policy to have in, in mm. marriage is like, you're going to be attracted to other people. And if you express it, then you don't have to like mm-hmm. save it up until it's, it's a problem. Um, but Definitely. Yeah, I think truth, truth to me is it just helps you stay sane because if, if you're like, if you keep being like, I see, I see that the speakers in front of me are black. I can't, I can't quite show you without disconnecting my computer, <laughs> but I promise they're black. This, this mic is black. And then everyone else um, around you is like, no, it's white. You can like check that against them and be like, ah, oh, crap. Uh, I guess it must be white. And that's like maybe dangerous if you're the dude in 1984 or whatever. But most of the time it's a, it's a, useful, um, a useful way of just like not being anxious. Because if, if you don't express things you're not quite sure about, if you're not like, if I don't say, I think it's black, even though everyone's saying white, then, then you, you don't get as much data and you can't figure out like where you stand in the world. I don't know if that made sense, mm. but it feels like an important- 100%, 100%. And that's um, what therapy is, because- I think. It's like you, you talk and talk and the therapist occasionally goes like, let me just point that thing out. Mm. <laughs> they won't say this probably if they're a qualified therapist, but that sounds fucking insane. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> if they say that, you should probably think, think- about your relationship with them, but maybe they're great. Who knows? Yeah, maybe I got to get a new therapist. Mine says that all the time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, Toby, I unfortunately do have to head off now, but oh. this has been an amazing conversation. It has. Um, yeah, we've been going I, more you than know what? I didn't even notice. But yeah, I feel well, like I talked more than you. Sorry. No, no. I feel like we had a great conversation. I did cool. just want to do one thing because do I it. came up with this game, and I'm afraid someone's going to steal <gasps> yes! it if, if we don't if we don't do it right now. Now, I'm someone who likes to make up games with the name first, and then I work backwards and I make the game. Um, so this game is called "If It Ain't Brokey, Do Fix It." Okay, so 
<laughs> Here's what it is, right? And we're just going to do one round. It's going to be a nice quick round, okay? The idea of this game is I'm going to throw to you a band and I want you to come in as their Rick Rubin type and give them a direction for their next album. It can be as abstract. It can be a look. It can be a tone. It can be a genre of music. I just want you to come in and give me an idea of what you think their next move should be. So, so um, flattered by this game. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I, I had a couple written down, but we don't have time. So I'm just going to give you one. Um, <laughs> I want you to, to tell me what you would do. Uh, if it ain't baroque, you do fix it. Your band is the Black Eyed Peas. Mm. All right. Black Eyed Peas. Um, they need to... Uh... They all need to read the Red Book by Jung, by Carl Jung, and um, and uh, uh, that's it. That's <laughs> beautiful. I'll just have to get through. That's it. That, <laughs> that's, that's like you, it. see, I I had no idea where that was going to go, and I love that it's literature. The, yeah, like that's there you that's go. an amazing choice. <laughs> <laughs> For those that don't, well, know, I don't even know if you know. That's that's. It's like a is most. I don't know if it's is most, but it's it's a kind of a. It seems like crazy stream of conscious dreaming for a full like four hundred pages or so. Uh, it's amazing. Yeah. I definitely think they have to read that book. Though. Yeah. Let's <laughs> let's let's send that to them right now. <laughs> All right. <laughs> should, should should I do one back at you? Is this how this works, or do you need to head? Yeah. Sure. Sure. Let's do it. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, if it ain't Baroque, do f- do fix it. Mm-hmm. Um, your band is. Oh, uh, oh, what are they called? Come on. Um, good drag. Imagine dragons. Are you familiar? Oh. Yep. Imagine Dragons, great choice. I Thank think you. what I would say for Imagine Dragons um, is that they should read the Red Book. No, <laughs> I, I, think that, I, think that, um, I think that Imagine Dragons, um, I, think it's a, I, think it's a, I think it's a jazz concept album, you know, mm. um, because for me, they've done, they've done stadium tours, but it's time for them to speak to the musicians of the world and really do something like I want to see their lead singer who doesn't even play it bring out the bassoon and have a bassoon solo. You know what I'm saying? This is this is the next level. People would be expecting a huge kind of stadium rock album and then they're going to flip the music industry on its head. Imagine dragons. Imagine what they could do. That's what I'll say. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing pitch. I'll clip that and send it to Universal. <laughs> <laughs> that works for me. We'll all get a cut, I hope. Well, great. Cheers. It, 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 does this feel like an appropriate place to, to end? I think this is a great place. I, I've i loved this chat. Thank you so much for having me on. Uh, for everybody for- listening, you can find me at Jez FM. Um, but to- but Baroki, great, great chat. Had a great time. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming. It was really, really nice. <laughs>